morning, everybody. It is uh, a pleasure to have here today Manuel Serrano. M many of you know him well. He's uh, presently he's uh, an investigator. He's a professor of the Research Council and an investigator at the CENIO, the National Center for Research in Oncology. Uh, he studied his uh, career in, in the early 90s, where he got his uh, PhD degree at the CBM, the, the, the Severo Ochoa CBM Center of the CSIC with Margarita Salas, and then moved from 1992 to 96 with Professor Rich at College Spring Harbor, where um, I think he made one of his uh, very well-known work on the discovery of P16. And uh, so, the, he, he, and ever since he has been uh, doing excellent research. Moved back to Spain first to the, I think, to the National Center of Biotechnology, where he became professor of the research council, and then moved to the newly uh, started Center of uh, Oncology or the CENIO, which uh, you all know. In addition to his uh, work on P16, he has been working on P53, but. Uh, probably is better known in the last year for his work on senescence. And uh, the, uh, similarly to these uh, mice that are oncomice, uh, there are also these mice which are oncoresistant mice, which he has been uh, working very actively. And the relationship which there, are, there is between uh, uh, oncogenes, metabolism, and aging. Uh, and well, I think this, uh, uh, is the subject of his talk today. I remind you that there are two lectures today. Uh, one is more this uh, scientific lecture he's giving this uh, now. And this afternoon at seven o'clock in the, uh, the, this l series of lectures on disease related to aging at the Fundación BBVA, which uh, you're all welcome to attend. Uh, we are counting how many of you are assisting. Um, well, his lecture today, the title is uh, Tumor Suppressor Genes in Cancer and Beyond. And I also like to thank him for uh, uh, being willing to both uh, talking about uh, work which is not being published and also to uh, accept that his presentation and this unpublished data will be known by uh, everybody. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jose Maria, for the kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here. It's an honor and a pleasure. I'm very much impressed by the Biobune. I have been here several times in Bilbao, but never in the center for one reason or another. So I'm very happy. And I know many people here I'm among friends. So I'm very happy. <clears throat> um, I know that you work on many different topics that are different from mine. We also work on a variety of topics, and I have chosen three topics that are in some published uh, work. And so this is a progress report, and it's very specialized. I, I will not have time for a lot of introduction, unfortunately, but I hope that at least one of the topics is of interest for you. I'm going to talk about three completely different topics, so you can disconnect and reconnect <laughs> whenever you want. You have three opportunities, <laughs> and I hope that at least one of them is interesting for you. I'm going to talk about senescence, and the first thing I want to say is that please uh, don't connect senescence with aging. The same way that you don't connect cell death with organismal death, senescence may or may not have to do with aging. When we are old, we are not full of senescent cells. Senescence is a response to stress, the same way as apoptosis is a response to stress. That's everything that you know about apoptosis, you can apply to senescence. Um, in the International Cancer Genome Consortium, the first data that they started to come out one of the satisfying messages was that most of the mutations, not all, but most of the mutations can be uh, 
put together in three pathways that are these three pathways. They, these three pathways were known, but I mean, this is now, I mean, this is now the result of a comprehensive analysis of many cancer geno genomes. One is the P53 pathway, the retinoblastoma pathway, and the P10 pathway. And this is a very schematic uh, representation of the pathways. ARF is a tumor suppressor that inhibits an oncogene, MDM2. You know this from the work of Mikkel, and MDM2 inhibits P53. It's a ubiquity in ligase. INC4, or P16, is an inhibitor of an oncogene, CDK4 cyclin D, a cyclin-dependent kinase that inhibits a repressor, a, a transcriptional repressor, RB. And P10 is the phosphatase that counteracts PA3 kinase and activates AKT. These two tumor suppressors are encoded by the same uh, genetic locus, the in 4 arf locus, and they respond to stress and damage. And uh, this is another way to put the same pathways. When these pathways, the P53 and the retinoblastoma pathway, are activated, the, re the, the cellular response is to eliminate the cells. The cells are eliminated by apoptosis or by senescence. And in both cases, the cells are eliminated. A cell with damage that activates these pathways is eliminated, is self-eliminated. And this is the basis for tumor suppression. Let me tell you a little bit about senescence because senescence was originally described as an anti-death mechanism. In vitro, when cells undergo senescence, they stay alive for good. People have maintained senescent cells for years. As long as you change the medium, they are alive. But this is in vitro. In vivo, all cells are undergoing replacement. And senescent cells are eliminated. Actually, in many cases, they are eliminated much faster than normal cells. There are mechanisms by macrophages and T cells that recognize senescent cells, and they are rapidly eliminated in, in the body. For a number of years, the, the, the existence of senescent cells in vivo in pathological uh, situations was unknown. And we were lucky to collaborate with Mariano Barbacid with a mouse model. And I'm going to spend a few, seconds, a few minutes in this because it will be used later. And it's, it's a mouse model with an inducible oncogenic KRAS. We can turn it from the wild type configuration to the oncogenic by adding tamoxifen to the mice. And it's endogenous. And the word endogenous is, is the key. This is the actual endogenous gene. It's not a transgene that is overexpressed. It's the real uh, KRAS in the, in the genome. This generates non-small cell lung carcinomas in a stepwise manner. This is indistinguishable from the human non-lung uh, adenocarcinoma. This is, this is the main type of uh, human lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, which is a subgroup of non-small cell lung carcinoma. Even the molecular profile by mRNA, the microarrays, is identical between the human and the mouse. This is the only mouse model that recapitulates with such a fidelity the human uh, disease. We reason that if there is a place in the, in the genome, um, I apologize for the colors, this should be blue. <laughs> uh, if there is a place in the body or a pathological circumstance where there is a stress, because I said before, I, I said before here that these pathways are induced by stress. So if there is a stressful environment, this is a tumor. Tumors are highly stressful environments, and we reason that there we should perhaps find senescent cells. And that was indeed the case. This is a, an, an illustration of a lung with an adenoma and a carcinoma. I'm going to make this distinction all the time. Pre-malignant, or sorry, I'm not going to use the word pre-malignant, it's confusing. Non-malignant and malignant. This is the non, for every kind of cancer, there is a non-malignant version and a malignant version. Uh, and this is the non-malignant version and this is the malignant one. The non-malignant tumors now is becoming a, <sighs> I don't want to, I mean, a general uh, observation, all non-malignant tumors are full of senescent cells. They, they are non-malignant precisely because they are senescent. And these are, this is a lung with a carcinoma and an adenoma, and you can see this is blue and this is not blue. The blue color indicates senescence-associated beta-galactosidase, which is a marker of senescence. And... Uh, 
well, of course, not all the cells here are senescent, the majority are, and the majority of cells here are not senescent. These carcinomas have evaded the senescent response. And actually, the, the idea now is that to evade senescence, to bypass senescence, is more important than to bypass apoptosis. And, well, and, and the other point I want to make is that apoptosis is not, the role of apoptosis in cancer is, uh, is not that clear. There are some leukemias and lymphomas where it's very important, but in the majority of solid tumors, is senescence the main tumor suppressive response? That's what people think. And this is a review with this picture that I show you with lung is general for many types of uh, tumors, work of many investigators, lung, uh, melanomas, prostate, pituitary tumors, uh, and so on, kidney, thyroid, and so on. And in humans, uh, people are starting to, to find this, the same thing, the same findings. Non-malignant tumors have senescent cells. They don't have apoptosis. Malignant tumors have uh, bypass senescence because they have mutated these tumor suppressor pathways of P53 and retinoblastoma. Let me show you here a, a summary of how I understand senescence, uh, uh, the current, the situation nowadays. When a cell goes from normal to non-malignant is through a series of uh, oncogenic mutations, activates uh, several mutations, and is here when the oncogenes reach a strong signaling. I have to make here another clarification. I said that the, the mouse model of Mariana Barbacid activates the KRAS oncogene, and one of the surprises is that they activate the KRAS oncogene in the entire body, and basically nothing happens. Only eight months later, tumors appear. You activate KRAS basically in the entire body, and you look for ERK. ERK is the key downstream effector of KRAS, and ERK is normal. And the reason for that is that nowadays it's known that there are many negative feedback loops. You may have oncogenic KRAS, but there are many negative feedback loops that are counteracting that. Only in the non-malignant tumor is when this ERK becomes active. And that is a signal for stress. There is an aberrant microenvironment, an aberrant tissue architecture, and this activates senescence. And these senescent cells are eliminated by T helper cells and macrophages, and this eliminates the tumor in many cases. The malignant version can arise from here or from here directly by mutations in oncogenes and tumor suppressors and bypassing P53, bypassing P16, and therefore here the senescent response is, is uh, not as uh, active. It is less active. I don't want to say that it's non-existent because chemotherapy nowadays is known that chemotherapy activates this senescent response. People, you ask an oncologist, uh, how does chemotherapy work? They say it induces apoptosis. And if you ask, show me the paper where uh, chemotherapy induces apoptosis, there is no paper. If you have HeLa cells and you put cisplatin, you induce apoptosis. But in a patient that you give chemotherapy and there is tumor regression and you look, and the, uh, many, many cases people do neoadjuvant chemotherapy. They give chemotherapy and then three or four days later they extract the tumor, they look for uh, apoptosis, there is no apoptosis. So the concept that chemotherapy is inducing apoptosis is, uh, is an expectation, but it has never been proven. Now people, when they are looking for senescence, they, there is senescence. Chemotherapy induces senescence, and these senescence tumors are uh, regressed by infiltration of T helper cells and macrophages, in many cases. We have also used the same mouse model to analyze pancreatic uh, tumors, and it's the same story. There is a non-malignant version, and there is a malignant version, and they have these names pancreatic intraductal neoplasia, and this is the pancreatic ductal uh, carcinoma here. And one of the things that, well, the same idea what, that I showed you before. The non-malignant version is blue. You can see here the blue cells. The non-malignant version has high levels of P16 and very low proliferation. K67 is a marker of proliferation. 
Uh, there is no proliferation, there is high levels of P16 and senescence. In the malignant version, in this version, even uh, a lesion that morphologically looks very similar is negative for senescence, negative for P16, and is highly proliferative. This is when the tumor has bypassed senescence. There is no P16, then there is proliferation, there is no senescence. This uh, was published uh, some time ago, but in the group of Mariano, they wanted to go one step ahead and mimic one of the main risk factors for pancreatic cancer, that is pancreatitis. People that have chronic pancreatitis are known to be at a higher risk of pancreatic cancer. Uh, so one of the things that they did is to mimic uh, pancreatitis. This can be done giving a, a compound to the mice, kerulein. This induces severe pancreatitis in the mice. And if you combine that with the mutation in KRAS, then instead of having a few tumors, there are many tumors, and they progress very efficiently to carcinoma. So here we had a surprise, and is that when we look at the uh, adenomas, at the non-malignant lesions, in the presence of an inflammatory microenvironment, this is, this, is the, this is what I showed you before. This is in the inflammatory microenvironment with kerulein. In the presence of kerulein, the same adenoma, the same type of lesions, now is not senescent. Now there is no P16. And we think that this is the reason why these uh, lesions progress much farther, because the inflammatory microenvironment, for reasons that we don't understand, is canceling the response of P53, P16, and so on. There are many examples in the literature of uh, cytokines and chemokines that activate MDM2, for example, and that could be a reason. But the, this world of the inflammation is very complicated. There are many. We don't know the detailed mechanism by which uh, the inflammatory microenvironment is suppressing senescence. And we can, we can uh, decrease the inflammatory response by giving an anti-inflammatory like Sulindac, which is used as a regular anti-inflammatory. And this decreases the progression from the early lesions to the carcinoma. There is a decrease in the number of lesions when the mice are given sulindac after the pancre uh, chronic pancreatitis. What happens in humans? Same story. We collaborated with uh, Manuel Rodriguez Justo in London because he has very special uh, samples of biopsies, biopsies from people that have had uh, chronic pancreatitis. And, and people with chronic pancreatitis, they usually have uh, these uh, early lesions, these uh, pancreatic intraductal neoplasias, this panning. Well, first of all, uh, the same story. The, the adenomas are positive for P16. The carcinomas are negative, eh? what I showed you before with the mice. These are senescent lesions. These are non-senescent. This is a, a human samples with no pancreatitis. Now. If we go to the lesions with pancreatitis are here. In these lesions that are here, the same type of lesions, morphologically the same, now here are negative for P16. This is what I show you with the mice. The mice with the, this kerulein, they were negative for senescence and negative for P16. And the same is true for the human pancreatitis, uh, the adenomas. And they also have patients that have been treated with an anti-inflammatory. And here, now, the senescent response returns and protects, presumably, the patients. So this is the, the, the message of this is that giving anti-inflammatory treatments to the patients with chronic pancreatitis can decrease the risk of uh, progression to carcinoma. So this is basically what I have said. I have added here this concept that the inflammatory microenvironment is decreasing the senescence response and therefore is impairing this anti-tumor uh, response. Inflammation is known to be a risk factor for many types of cancers, for prostate, for colon, and, and others. That, now I don't remember, ah, for, uh, for liver, hepatitis, prostatitis, all that, uh, colitis, 
produces is a risk factor for, for cancer. Um, well, going back to the to the basic concepts, cellular stress induces apoptosis or senescence in different types of cells, and this is a protection from cancer. But one thing that has been lacking for senescence to, to reach a higher status is to show the existence of senescence in a non-pathological process. This is something that we, because there is apoptosis in non-pathological processes. So we have been looking for senescence in non-pathological processes, in particular during development in morphogenesis. In morphogenesis, apoptosis is used by the, by the cells to sculpt the body, to, to make uh, the fingers and many other uh, processes. So we have been wondering why senescence is not used during development. Or is it used? That, that has been the question. So we have been looking, and we are still looking for senescence in embryos, cutting embryos, different mouse embryos, of course, at different uh, times of development, and looking for senescence. And most of it has been negative. But I say most of it, but not all of it. We have found senescence here. I, I'm going to show you this uh, blow up. Uh, unfortunately, this is not, here looks much nicer, but there is a, a very intense blue here in this uh, epithelium. What is this? This is the ear, the developing ear. I didn't know much about the ear until very recently, but <laughs> let me tell you that basically the ear has five tubes, uh, one, two, three, four, and five. The five tubes come from the same vesicle originally, and one of the tubes uh, is separated from the rest and has a different cellular composition and a different behavior, and is this one, number one. Actually, this one, number one. This is called the endolymphatic sac. This is the tube that is in charge of producing the liquid that is bathing this, uh, the cochlea and the... Um, and the labyrinth, these uh, tubes that are responsible for hearing and for balance. So this one is different, and this one is senescent. And we have been studying that. Here you can see it, uh, senescent response. The, uh, it's known that at this time of development, this is day 14.5, at this time of development, there is an invasion of these cells coming uh, from, if there is an invasion with cells coming from the neuroectoderm. There are a number of cells that come here, these red cells, and go there. And probably the original residents have to be non-proliferating. And we think that this is the reason of this senescence. These cells that originally were proliferating, like their sisters, they stop and they become invaded by cells that are coming from the neuroectoderm. And it's here. We have been doing some genetics, and we have found some surprises. Most of the senescence response uh, in relation to DNA damage, to cancer, and so on, are highly dependent on p53. But this one is not. It's dependent on p21. And p21 is a, a transcriptional target of p53. And, and this was a surprise. So let me explain this a little bit better. This is the senescence in the wild type in the P53 knockout cells, uh, mice, and these are the P21 knockout. You can see here, this is the staining for K67, and there is many cells are positive for K67, and here only a few cells are positive. So these tubes are senescent and poorly proliferating, and the same is here, and here everything is uh, the opposite. P21 is a transcription factor, it's a, it's a gene that is a cell cycle inhibitor that is upregulated by P53. This is the, the traditional view. But P21 has other uh, inducers that are independent of P53, like FOXO or TGF beta or PA3 kinase uh, pathways. So we are exploring, we don't know now which is, the, which is the signaling pathway that activates P21 independently of P53, but we are investigating that. So I can 
add one little example. Actually, we have two examples. There is one that I haven't mentioned. Two examples of senescence during development. Uh, one is the endolymphatic sac, and the other one is the mesonephros. The mesonephros is the embryonary kidney. During development, we have a, a primitive kidney that at, the, at these days of development in the mice is, um, suffers involution, is eliminated almost completely, and then there is the final, the adult kidney, the definitive kidney. So this involution of the mesonephros is also characterized by senescence. I haven't shown you the data, but it's the same story. There is uh, the same type of senescence, and it's also dependent on P21 and independent of P53. So we, we are happy with adding senescence to this uh, picture because it gives more prestige to the response even though it's minor compared to, I said before that senescence probably is more important than apoptosis in um, cancer protection and in chemotherapy response, but definitely in development, apoptosis is more important than senescence. But at least there are two examples of senescence during development. So now I'm going to change topics completely and talk about a different thing because I wanted to bring here a, a progress report of the exciting uh, of, of what I think is exciting in, in our lab. And I'm going to talk about notch and lung cancer. Um, collaborating with Mariana Barbacid on lung cancer, we got I mean, we got interested in lung cancer and for reasons that now I, I don't remember how because this was years ago, we got interested in, in this pathway, the, the notch pathway. Let me mention a few words about the notch pathway. Gamma secretase is a protease. It's a protease that is in the cytoplasmic membrane. It's formed by four subunits. The four of them are essential to make the complex. One of the subunits is the protease called presenilin that is the enzymatic activity, of it's a protease. And the substrates of this protease are in the cytoplasmic membrane. The best known, well, one of the traditional ones is the amyloid precursor protein, APP, which is responsible for the beta amyloid protein that accumulates in Alzheimer. Because of this pathway, pharmaceutical companies have developed fantastic inhibitors of gamma secretase that work in vivo that have been tested in uh, human clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three. Last year was canceled the last phase three clinical trial. After two years, after patients, hundreds of patients have been, of Alzheimer's, uh, have been for two years under this, uh, uh, taking these gamma secretase inhibitors. The reason why the, the clinical trials have been stopped is not because of toxicities or is not because the drug didn't work, all that has been worked out and, and confirmed, but because the Alzheimer's uh, disease was not improved. So it didn't improve the, the progression of the disease. But the, the, mess, the point here is that there are very good inhibitors of uh, gamma secretase. And this is the one used in humans, semagathestat, and the one I'm going to talk about is this one from Eli Lilly. Why is this interesting? Well, because about 10 years ago, it was recognized that notch is also a very important oncogene in some cancers and tumor suppressors in other cancers. Everything I'm gonna talk about is about the oncogenic. In some tissues, notch is oncogenic, and in other tissues, it's a tumor suppressor. I'm gonna talk about the oncogenic activity. So notch is a receptor, and when it binds the ligands, are called delta, is the famous ligand. When it binds the ligand, it changes the, the conformation, and gamma secretase can cleave a notch. This uh, cleavage produces a cytoplasmic uh, protein. It releases a cytoplasmic domain called notch intracellular domain. There are four notches, one, two, three, four. And this intracellular uh, domain um, peptide, this is the carboxy terminus, goes to the nucleus, and there it binds a transcription factor with DNA binding specificity, RBPJ, and this one becomes active. RBPJ is silent in the absence of notch IC. When notch IC binds, then it becomes active, 
and this triggers a transcriptional response, very complex. One of the main, but not the only one, uh, mediators is HES1. I'm going to talk about this one. And HES1 is another transcription factor, so this gets very complicated, that activates many things. Um, in 2004, uh, uh, the laboratory of John Astor and Thomas Luke, they reported that Notch1 was an oncogene in T acute lymphoblastic leukemia with mutations exactly where the gamma secretase cleaves or in the degradation domain of the C terminus. The, the mutations make a hyperstable notch. This domain becomes uh, hyperactive, independent of the ligand, and hyperactive. This was in 2004, and then little by little, people started to uh, uh, study uh, lung cancer uh, and solid cancers. And Pierpaolo Di Fiore reported, uh, now it's only three years back, the same type of mutations in notch one in lung cancer, in lung cancer, they reported here in the cleavage domain and in the stabilization domain. And they reported that the pathway is hyperactive in many human lung cancers. The way to say hyperactive is because they measure HES1. HES1 is, the, is the, this one. If HES1 is high, the pathway is hyperactive, is the readout. So, we have used the mouse model of Mariano because it's a good model of um, adenocarcinoma. Uh, LAN adenocarcinomas, <laughs> these are divisions and subdivisions and subdivisions, but the, the non-small cell lung carcinomas, the main group is the adenocarcinomas. Adenocarcinomas, two-thirds of the adenocarcinomas have mutations in the EGF receptor, and now they are very good inhibitors for EGF receptor that are used in the clinic and they are good. Uh, they, they delay cancer progression. And the other third, uh, they have mutations in KRAS. For those, there is no, um, currently there is no uh, any targeted therapy. We found that 100% of the tumors that appear in this mouse model have the notch one, the notch pathway hyperactive. Perhaps KRAS requires hyperactive notch to, be, to produce a tumor. So we tested that hypothesis. I'm going to pass this. With the some genetics, we combine the, the inducible KRAS mice with the presenilin knockout. Actually, it's a bit more complicated because there are two presenilin genes. So this is the double knockout for presenilin 1 and 2. Anyway, the bottom line is that when the lung doesn't have presenilin, then carcinomas, doesn't, they do not appear. There is nothing, uh, well, one thing I haven't said. Grade one, two, three, and four. Grade one, two, and three are adenomas, is the non-malignant version. Grade four is the malignant one. Each cancer type has different names and grades. is a, a little bit confusing. Uh, so one, two, and three are non-malignant. Four is the adenocarcinoma. And there are no adenocarcinomas when presenilin is absent. So KRAS cannot initiate and produce a cancer in the lung if the presenilin is not working. Presenilin is essential for the gamma secretase. No gamma secretase, no notch activity. To confirm that this is the pathway, is not a, 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 because gamma secretase has other substrates in addition to the amyloid precursor protein and notch, has others, we did the same experiment with the RBPJ knockout combination of KRAS with RBPJ knockout, no carcinomas. And actually, the few adenomas that appear here, non-malignant, they are escapers. They are uh, cases where, where the, the knockout didn't work, because this is an excision with CRI, adenocri, and sometimes CRI uh, can activate the oncogene, but not excise the, the RBPJ gene. So, the, the classical notch pathway is essential for initiation and, produ uh, and to produce a, a lung cancer. We wanted to take advantage of these uh, gamma secretase inhibitors that have been produced for Alzheimer and now are not used for Alzheimer. They are abandoned to see if they could be effective for lung cancer, if the cancer is addicted to the notch pathway because because a, a protein can be necessary for the initiation of a cancer, but it may become 
useless for the maintenance of the cancer. This is uh, uh, one thing that we always take into account. One thing is initiation and the other one is maintenance. Um, so we wanted to focus in the carcinomas in the grade four and one of the first things that we had to do is that um, when you have a mouse that has many tumors, you, there is no way to know which one is the, an adenoma and which one is a carcinoma. So we try to use the same criteria used in the clinic in, in, for humans, that is to be PET positive, positron emission tomography positive. So we are treating these mice the same way as a, as a human in a hospital. And we confirm, for example, this is a, a mouse with one, two, three, four, five PET positive tumors and many tumors that are PET negative. Then we do histology and there is a one-to-one -one correlation. All the PET positive tumors are carcinomas, all the PET negative tumors are adenomas. Same as in humans. So, the way we have done this clinical trial, if I may use that word, uh, with mice is the following. When the mice are, uh, are three months old, we activate the KRAS oncogene. Then we have to wait about six months for the tumors to appear. And at, at, after six months, we start to make, on a routine basis, PET-CT, positron emission tomography and computerized tomography. And when a mouse has a PET-positive tumor, then it enters uh, the trial. So it enters the trial and it's treated for 15 days with this uh, gamma secretase inhibitor. The same doses that have been used, the equivalent doses that have been used in humans because uh, Eli Lilly has published all this and the, the pharmacokinetics and the doses and all that is very well known. We have done exactly what they told us to do. And then, uh, then we evaluate by PET if there has been a response and then we can do histology. This is one mouse before the treatment and this is the same mouse two weeks later and two weeks later, in two weeks, some of the tumors grow a lot, others have not grown that much, of the mouse treated with vehicle. This is one example, I will show you quantification in a second, and this is one example of a mouse treated with the in gamma secretase inhibitor, and the same mouse 15 days later. Actually, these are the images that are quantified here. This, are, this is the tumor, and this is the heart, with vehicle, and this is the tumor, and this is the tumor after treatment with the inhibitor. Anyway, the important figure is here. If you focus here, please, the positron emission tomography. In this assay, we have six mice with 11 PET positive tumors. And we call one to day one to the, to the size of the tumor at presentation when it's entered into the trial. And, and we calculate how much it grows in 15 days, in 15 days or in 22 days, well, in this case in 15 days. So most of the tumors on average, they multiply by two, some of them multiply by four, others don't grow. But this is biology, I mean, this is the, the typical variation. And probably you have noticed, the ones treated with the gamma secretase inhibitors do not grow. Here, now, another comment. Some people say, well, but don't people say that cancer is curing mice very easily? Sometimes there is this cynical comment, oh, well, uh, uh, to cure cancer in mice is, is trivial. Well, this is true and this is not true. Uh, <laughs> the devil is in the details. Xenograft, uh, xenografts are human cancer cell lines that are injected subcutaneously and xenografts are they respond very good to chemotherapy. But this type of cancer that is, a, a, is induced by the endogenous uh, oncogene and it takes months to develop, these cancers are as difficult to treat and as unresponsive as the human versions. Um, Tyler Jacks has a very similar mouse model and he usually, he has been the president of the AICR, the American Association for Cancer Research, and he says, please find a, a chemotherapy that works for these kinds of cancer, because if it works in these kinds of cancers, it's going to work in, in humans. So far, the only uh, report, uh, actually from the people from, from Lou Candy, uh, using Tyler Jacks' mouse model, the only, mm, 
the only targeted therapy that works in these mice is the inhibition of MEK. Hmm? And, and it produces the same thing. There is no regression. It's only a block the growth of the tumors. One advantage of the mice, of course, is that we can do all kinds of analysis. And for example, well, I apologize again for the quality. Believe me, uh, uh, this is HES1. These are three, three examples of three different tumors uh, of mice treated with vehicle, and this is highly positive. I told you that all the tumors uh, in this mouse model are highly positive for the pathway, for HES1. The mice that have been treated with the inhibitor, they are negative. Much negative, I mean, there is a big difference with these ones, although it doesn't project here. We have looked at K67, it is decreased. There is very little apoptosis, it's decreased. And we have looked at all the, we have tried to find, because there is no precedent in the literature that notch, the notch pathway is required for the KRAS pathway. There is no evidence for that. So we have been looking at the usual suspects, uh, MIC, S6 kinase, mTOR, PFE kinase, and, and others that I, AKT, and others that I forget, but are in the supplementary figures. But with one exception that was ERK. ERK is the essential mediator of KRAS to produce a, a carcinoma. And this ERK is inhibited in the, in the mice that are treated. Actually, there is a good correlation in this particular mouse the gamma secretase inhibitor was not as effective as in these other two. And here, there was not such an effective inhibition of phosphoerc. It's lower than here, but not as much. There is a good correlation between, between the, the biomarker of the drug, which is this one, this is the biomarker, and the inhibition of the RAS pathway. We have been trying, we have done work with uh, cancer cell lines in vitro, and we have been doing microarrays and chips and all that. I'm going to spare you from all that and just tell you that after doing these microarrays, finding putative candidates, doing shRNAs for these candidates, demonstrating that HES1 binds to these candidates and so on, we have found one protein that we think is the mediator of this and is the dual phosphatase DASP1. DASP1 is an inhibitor of ERK as you know, ERK is phosphorylated in serine, threonine, and tyrosine. And there is a family of dual phosphatases that the phosphorylate serine, threonine, and tyrosine. And DASP1 is one of the members of this family. And we have found that HES1 is a repressor of this phosphatase. Basically, what the pathway is doing is decreasing one of the inhibitors of ERK. So ERK, to reach full activity, full oncogenicity, requires KRAS, the mutant, the mutation in KRAS, and low levels of these phosphatases. Otherwise, MEK is counteracted by these phosphatases. And there is another summary in the next slide of what I just said. This is the situation of KRAS-driven adenocarcinomas. We think that the EGF receptor-driven carcinomas uh, they go through a different pathway. This doesn't apply to the EGF receptor carcinomas, only to the KRAS. I said that one third, 30% of human adenocarcinomas have mutation in KRAS. They require this pathway to maintain DASP1 inhibited and therefore is, is not inhibiting ERK. If we treat with the gamma secretase inhibitor, then the pathway is switch off DASP1 goes up, and we have data for that in the mice. DASP1 goes up and is counteracting ERK, and therefore the tumor cannot keep growing. And one good thing about this, I mentioned that Luke Handley and Tyler Jacks, they have demonstrated that MEK inhibitors are able to arrest these tumors in mice. And of course, this is very interesting because this is another inhibitor that can be combined with this one and is acting in a different pathway. And perhaps gamma secretase inhibitors with the MEK inhibitors are, are more effective and, and not only arrest the tumor, but induce regression. That, that is the goal. And in the last 10 minutes, I'm gonna change gears again and talk about reprogramming because it's one of the topics in the lab and, and I think that 
I, I want to share this, perhaps uh, this brings up collaborations and so on. A few words about reprogramming. You know that, well, here uh, another thing I have to say is one thing is the pluripotent stem cells and the other thing is the adult stem cells. Both are stem cells but the pluripotent and the adult are completely different and the adult stem cells are now mm, considered more closer, are, are closer to differentiated somatic cells than to pluripotent embryonic stem cells. Pluripotent, the embryonic stem cells are, are cells that are unique, are very, very different from the rest. Martin Evans was the first one to, to cultivate these cells and to demonstrate that they are pluripotent and you can get a mouse from these cells. And Yamanaka in 2006 demonstrated that you can get cells from, differentiated cells from anywhere in the body and with three or four uh, transcription factors you can make them pluripotent, induce pluripotent stem cells that are functionally indistinguishable to embryonic stem cells. The efficiency of this is at most 0 0.1, uh, uh, 10 to the minus 4, at most. Out of 10,000 cells, one uh, is reprogrammed successfully. This is not a limitation because to get 10,000 cells is not that difficult, but just bear in mind uh, this low efficiency. We wonder whether these cell cycle inhibitors, P21, P20, these are inhibitors of cycling dependent kinases that are here, play a role in this um, reprogramming. Because there was, and there is the idea, that perhaps this process of reprogramming has some resemblance somehow to the reprogramming that happens during cancer. This idea is not, it was favored a few years ago, but not that much favor nowadays. But anyway, that was the motivation to see if tumor suppressors, which are preventing cancer, are also preventing reprogramming. And this is the case. And, uh, we published uh, this paper saying that the in 4 r locus is a barrier for IPS reprogramming. If this locus is inactivated, the efficiency of reprogramming is multiplied by 10. It's an important factor eh, to, to improve the efficiency. And, and, and there is an explanation here of a summary of the paper. This locus, um, that is more complicated than I said, because it has three genes, P15, P19, and P16, p 16 in 4 a is a homologue of p 15 in 4 b They behave identically from a biochemical point of view. And P19-ARF is the activator, so ARF is the activator of P53, P16 and P15 are activators of retinoblastoma. Two of the three pathways that I mentioned in the very beginning. In young cells, the expression of these genes is, is basal. Let, let me call it basal and poised. Poised is because it's known that it's maintained in a particular epigenetic state called polycom. And this polycom is characterized by low levels of expression, but the capability to become active. Actually, when we become old, the cells become old, and we, I mean, uh, uh, this has been demonstrated in humans and in mice, in many different tissues. When we age, this gene becomes active becomes active and uh, the polycom is lost and this becomes active and the same is true when cells are stressed by an oncogene or damage and so on. Here. So one of the things that we have found, we reported is that these reprogramming factors also produce high, a, a lot of stress to the cells. It's a mitogenic stress and as soon as the um, reprogramming factors are introduced, this gene becomes active and the reprogramming process is aborted. So part of the reason why the reprogramming is, is so inefficient is because it's aborted by the activation of this locus. In a few cells, in a few cells for reasons that we don't understand, probably there is a stochastic uh, component there that is uh, many investigators 
have data supporting that there is a, an important stochastic component for some reason is successfully reprogrammed and then it acquires a different epigenetic uh, configuration. This configuration is called bivalent. Bivalent is a combination in the same nucleosome of the, of the signal that is activating here, K4 trimethylation, and the one that is inhibitory, K27 trimethylation. But bivalent is not something in between this and this. This is a, a misconception. It's not something that is in between. It's a completely different configuration that is characteristic but not unique of embryonic stem cells. And when, cells, when genes are in this configuration, they are completely silent. It's, the expression is absolutely zero. And so this is the situation. When these embryonic stem cells differentiate, they acquire the polycom configuration and they are ready to become active if needed. When we did these uh, experiments, we, try, we tested many, uh, the initial uh, reprogramming experiments. We used fibroblasts lacking P15, P16, of P53, P21, P27, and others. And, and this is what I mentioned before. In this uh, series of experiments, the efficiency of reprogramming with the three factors, OCT4, KLF4, SOX2, was 1% for the wild types, and here was 15 there was a factor of 15 times improvement. I have to say that uh, this is about as much as it has been achieved in reprogramming, still 100% has not been achieved. Anyway, um, the person who did these experiments was very thorough and she also did double combinations and single combinations. And I'm saying that because Double combinations do not work. This was reported initially by Yamanaka and confirmed by many people that only two factors do not work. But she found, and, and this was true for most of the, of the um, genotypes, that the double combinations gave zero. But in the P27 knockout, we observed with OCT4 and KLF4 a 0.01%. Very low, but detectable. It was possible, I'm, I'm sorry that you don't see here the pictures, but I mean, there were colonies. If you played sufficient number of cells, you can obtain colonies. And actually, these uh, IPS colonies induced pluripotent stem cells from P27 knockout that were reprogrammed in the absence of SOX2, they produce chimeras. So that was very surprising to us to be able to produce chimeras in the absence of SOX2 when we eliminate P27. This means that absence of P27 somehow makes SOX2 and uh, um, makes ectopic SOX2 unnecessary. Uh, for sure, the endogenous SOX2 is necessary, but the ectopic, we don't have to put ectopically SOX2 to obtain some reprogramming. This was intriguing because as far as we knew, there is no connection between P27 and SOX2. And I mean, we are mouse people, and we started to think about the mice. And with the P27, there is a, a, a mystery that I think that has been unsolved until now, and I think that perhaps we have an explanation for that mystery. Let me explain you the mystery. P27 mice have this phenotype. They, they are bigger, the mice are bigger, all the organs are bigger. The mice have pituitary tumors, and they have a particular defect in the retina that I will show you in a second. What is the mystery about that? The mystery about that is the following. P27 is an inhibitor. The main, the main activity of P27 is to inhibit CDK2. And Mariano Barbasit, some years ago, when they did the knockout of CDK2, they wanted to demonstrate that CDK2 was the, the activity responsible for the P27 phenotypes. If you don't have P27, the expectation is that you have an upregulated CDK2, and that upregulated CDK2 was responsible for this phenotype. So they made the double knockout P27 CDK2. And the surprise was that none of these phenotypes was rescued when CDK2 was inactivated. And they published that in, in cancer cell because was, it was a negative result, but was very surprising. No one expected that. And the implication was that P27 perhaps 
has another target, has another target that is responsible for this uh, defect. What are the phenotypes of SOX2? The, the knockout mice, the minus minus mice are lethal, but the heterozygotes are smaller. They have hypopituitarism and they have anophthalmia. They have uh, severe uh, defects in the retina. And also there is a human syndrome called MEN4 that uh, has mutations in SOX2 with the same uh, phenotypes than in mice. I'm gonna go fast and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna explain everything, only the important things. In mouse embryofibroblasts, the ones that we reprogram only with two factors, we observe that there is more SOX2. SOX2 levels in mouse embryofibroblasts are almost undetectable. But in this P27 knockout, there is about seven times more. Highly variable, but seven times more in all the cells. This is here. It's not that we have a, a, a minor population of cells that is contaminating the cultures. No, all the cells have, more, uh, have higher levels of SOX2. These levels of SOX2 are one order of magnitude lower than in embryonic stem cells. If, we, if I plot here embryonic stem cells, it would be like 100. But perhaps this uh, small amount of SOX2 is sufficient to initiate the loops because these uh, uh, stemness genes are known to be involved, all of them, in positive feedback loops, all of them. SOX2 activates, SOX4, SOX4 activates, uh, KLF4, KLF4, SOX2, they activate to each other. And, well, to cut the long story short, we found P27 bound to the SOX2 enhancer. SOX2 has an important enhancer called SRR2. It's the critical enhancer for the expression of SOX2 in pluripotent cells. And we did chromatin IP, P27 doesn't bind to DNA, but it binds other proteins that are bound to, the, uh, to this enhancer. Here we have the chromatin IP of P27 in the, um, in the embryonic stem cells differentiated with retinoic acid. It binds to the repressed SOX2. It doesn't bind to the active SOX2. Sorry that I'm not explaining this properly. Minus retinoic acid are induced pluripotent stem cells where SOX2 is highly active and P27 is not there. When these cells differentiate, SOX2 is repressed and P27 is participating or associates together with the repression of SOX2. We have characterized, following some leads in the literature, we have characterized the repressive complex in this enhancer because the, the activating complex in this enhancer is known, is SOX2 and OCT4, but the um, uh, repressive complex when this cells differentiate is not known and we report uh, that is uh, P130 and E2F4. There is a complex of P130 and E2F4 and SYN3A, which is a co-repressor, that binds to the enhancer, and P27 binds there. I mean, one of these uh, unexpected trends, uh, we were trying to find if P27, I mean, you, perhaps you're thinking, but does P27 bind to P130 or E2F4 or SYN3A? Well, we were testing that, and in this January, so one month ago, there was a paper from Barcelona by Oriol Bax, that is P27 represses transcription by direct interaction with P130 and E2F4. So he published exactly the same thing. Uh, he published the biochemical evidence for P27 binding and repressing transcription through P130 and E2F4. They don't report repression of SOX2, but uh, they report uh, repression of other genes. So, we think that we don't have to, to do these experiments anymore. We were struggling trying to find this interaction, but the interaction is here. And, and this applies to the SOX2 enhancer. And so what happens with the mystery? Can we rescue the phenotypes of P27 knockout inactivating SOX2? And the answer is yes, we can. All the things that inactivation of CDK2 didn't do, because didn't rescue anything, everything is rescued by SOX2. For example, this is in the pituitary, this is the layer of stem cells in the wild type mice, this is a stain for SOX2. This layer 
is hyperplastic. And this is the cause, this is the, the, the reason of the tumors, of the pituitary tumors. And when this is combined with the um, SOX2 heterozygous, only one copy of SOX2 is deleted, is rescued. If this is done with CDK2 knockout, nothing happens. This, it remains. Mariano did that. And this is the pituitary mass. The pituitary tumors are rescued. The size is rescue of the mice, I'm not showing you that. And these are the uh, retinal phenotypes that is not very clear, but there is a layer here in the internuclear layer of the retina. There is a subpopulation of SOX2 positive cells. In the P27 knockout retinas, this is disrupted. There are ectopic cells, cells that should not be positive are positive, and there are uh, strange um, situations like this one. And all this is rescue when we delete one copy of SOX2. And none of this is rescue in activating CDK2. So this is the last slide. Um, this is the, this was known. This, the, the enhancer of SOX2 is downstream of SOX2. And this enhancer in pluripotent cells is maintained active by OCT4 and SOX2, is activating SOX2. This is one of these positive feedback loops that I mentioned. When these cells differentiate, this complex is substituted by this E2F4P130 complex that uh, Oriol Bax has found that it binds to P27. And we have found that P27 actually binds here in this enhancer. And this maintains SOX2 fully repressed. In the cells that don't have P27, the repression is not as potent. It's weaker. And this produces elevated levels of SOX2 sufficient to make these cells reprogrammable by OCT4 and KL4 alone without the necessity of putting ectopic SOX2. And I'm listing here some of our collaborators and the people who have done uh, this work. And I will be very happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thanks for the great talk. I'm going to try to put a question that covers all the three aspects of the, of the That's talk. That's a great idea because <laughs> yeah. you will help me to unify the three. Yeah, so you're talking about senescence and the, the role of senescence in, in prevention or alternative to apoptosis in cancer. You were showing beautiful data on how the progression of adenoma to adenocarcinoma results in a critical change in, in cellular metabolism as measured by PET. Hmm. And then you were, you were highlighting how regulators of cell cycle or SOX2, like P27, can impact also on organismal size. Hmm. What do you think that is the, the crosstalk between these senescence pathways and the switch of cancer metabolism, that switch that you see from adenoma that is senescent hmm. Hmm. to carcinoma? Because it's, hmm. it's black and white in all conditions. Well. These are not our data, but in the case of P53, as you know very well, P53 maintains the oxidative phosphorylation program, and inactivation of P53 favors the glycolytic anaerobic glycolysis. Other than that, there is not much I can say. We have no, I don't have any idea about P16 or RB uh, in relation to this anaerobic glycolysis switch. I don't know. Any Topic for investigation. Maria. Hi, uh, I'm actually going to focus on the second part in the notch and lung cancer. So um, I'm interested from the point of view of stem cells, what's happening with the stem cells there? Because notch obviously regulates stem cell. And I was curious to hear that the tumors actually do not disappear. They, mm. they do not grow. Mm. So. How do you explain that? Well, I don't know if you follow the, the field of the lung stem cells, but it's, it's very controversial. And we spend a lot of time working on the Basques, Basques uh, uh, with a B, of the bronchioalveolar stem cells. And as you know now, people say that all that work is 
crap, I don't know, <laughs> okay, that is not true. Uh, that is, I mean, these Basques are now, uh, uh, it's a forbidden word, uh, you cannot use that. And now other people say that they have found these uh, land stem cells and the other, I mean, nobody knows, as, as far as I know, it's not clear which are the, the land stem cells. And even worse, uh, more controversial, which are the, the progenitor cells for the adenocarcinomas, because the progenitor cells for the adenocarcinomas may not be the land stem cells. So we work on that, and we had to put all that in a drawer because, uh, because people don't believe on that. Any other? In, in the Lily experiments with humans with uh, Alzheimer, yes. did they find any, I mean, they probably treated many, many patients, any reduction in the cancer, lung cancer? No, because Some I... Some data I, on that, that they could come I in? don't think, I think that, I mean, to have a cancer was a, a reason for exclusion from the, from the clinical trial. I mean, it was done only with Alzheimer's patients. They, they didn't study no, cancer. I mean, when they take... Hundred, I mean, thousands of people with Alzheimer. With a, 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 if, did, did they see any difference in the treated versus placebo in the number of lung cancer no, that, that, no. that develop in an old no. population? No, but I think that the numbers that they use are not sufficient because I think that in the phase three clinical trial they were like 500 or 600. Um, Probably there was, and it was for only for two years. I don't know how many lung cancers appear in 500 people. Try now. <laughs> this is funny because uh, they they are starting all over. They they are developing a new gamma secretase inhibitor. They and other companies, because this one uh, was patented, I don't know, 10 years ago. They only have five years of patent protection, so it's not worth to put that into the market for oncology. And so they are developing a new one that is slightly different, but it's new, and they will have 15 years of protection. One very general question. So there are genes that can be tumor suppressors or oncogenic. What is the current definition of a tumor suppressor? Is it now more mechanistic than genetically, or what is your point of view about that? The, the traditional definition is that the gene is inactivated in cancer. If the gene is inactivated in cancer, it's because it's incompatible with the cancer and therefore it's a tumor suppressor. That is the definition. That this is a strict definition. And for oncogene, it's the same. It has to be mutated in cancer. Another thing is that a, a, a protein can have tumor suppressive activity, that if you overexpress it, if you manipulate it, it can, it can have the activity of a tumor suppressor. But to be a tumor suppressor, uh, for most people, it requires mutations in, the, in, the, in cancers. Any other question or comment? Is one there? Thank you. Uh, I have uh, one question. Uh, do you use, did you use other kind of reprogramming factor, for example, the SMIC factor? Did I use, say again? Do you use a other kind of reprogramming factor, no. for example, the SMIC factor? O other, other reprogramming factors different than this? No. Yep. No, no, we didn't. Okay. Thank you. And other, uh, do you use other kind of, of cells, for example, in very bodies for this? No, no, no. We have uh, only used uh, fibroblasts. Okay, thank you. More questions, comments? If not, thank you, Manuel. It's been a pleasure.